Okay, so for 16, we have the function f of x is equal to negative three plus six x squared minus two x cubed. And we're looking for the largest open interval on which the graph is both concave up and it's increasing. Okay, so for this, we're gonna either take the first and second derivatives and see where they're both gonna be positive. So see what interval they're both positive. So let's go ahead, let's first take the derivatives. So f prime of x will be 12x minus 6x squared. And f double prime of x will be 12 minus 12x. Now let's solve for the zeros of them because that'll give us critical values and potential inflection points. So we wanna find where f prime of x is zero. So zero is gonna be equal to, let's factor out a six x from there. That'll give us um, two minus x. So our two zeros could be x is zero and then x is two. Six x, six times zero could be zero and two minus x could be zero if x is two. So two possible, two possible critical values here. And then let's look now for where the second derivative could be zero. And that's gonna be just simply at one. We can just see 12 minus 12 X. So X has to be one. All right, so I'm gonna use a space down here. because It's like we're gonna need some more space. So we're gonna break our interval up at zero, two and one or zero, one and two, say zero one and two and we want to see like what's going on what's going on you know um with the second derivative and first derivative so we're gonna look at the second derivative up here and we'll look at the first derivative down here so um because the first the first derivative is divided at zero and two the second derivative you only need to check at to the left of one and after one. So let's look at what f double prime of zero is. So if we take the second derivative of zero, we're gonna get 12 minus zero. That's a, that's a positive number. So if it's positive here, we're gonna know it's concave up here. But let's see if it changes. So let's, let's just then now check f double f double prime of two. So 12 minus 12 times two, or 12 minus 24, negative 12. And that is indeed the negative number. So it's concave down here. Okay, so now we just want to see where it's also going to be um, increasing. So where where is the where is the first derivative also positive? So let's check. Um, Let's check, it, let's check out the first derivative. So we can check, um, let's see the first derivative at negative one. So this one, we wanna see what's going on over here. So I'm gonna just evaluate it up here. So F full prime of negative one, that'll be negative 12 minus six. So that's negative. So it's negative here. So we know it's decreasing. So we, so the only possible option is here. Let's see if it's going to be, well, it has to be that one, but let's, let's just, let me just, let's just verify to make sure we're good. So let's check F prime of one. F prime of one, 12 minus six. That is indeed a positive number. So then our first derivative is positive. So then it's increasing here and it's concave up here, and the intersection will be from zero to one. So in this region, it's both concave up and increasing. So the answer will be A. All right, number 17, we have a particle that moves along the x-axis. So that a time t more than zero, its position is given by x of t equals 12 e to the negative t times the sine of t. What's the first time t at which the velocity of the particle is zero? Okay, so um, let's recall that 
velocity is the derivative of position. So if we take the derivative of, of this equation and just solve for the zeros of it, that's essentially going to tell us where the velocity is zero. So let's go ahead, let's do that. So x prime of t. This is going to be the product rule because we have we have two functions here. We have 12 e to the negative t and we have the sine of t. So let's first take the derivative of 12 e to the negative t. And that'll be negative 12 e to the negative t because we take the derivative of negative t, which is negative one. And we keep the second function the same. So times sine of t. And we add 12 e to the negative t. Get that out of the way. And now we multiply by the derivative of the sine of t. The derivative of the sine of t is the cosine of t. I hate squeezing it in here, but here it is. Now we find where this is equal to zero. We want to find the zeros of it. So we're going to set this equal to zero. And we can factor out a 12 e to the negative t. Multiply by negative sine of t plus the cosine of t. So our zero has to be this group. So we're going to set zero equal to the negative sine of t plus the cosine of t. And essentially, we're just looking for where's the cosine and the sine function equal. Where's the sine of t equal to, to the cosine of t after I add sine of t to both sides? And you have to just know your unit circle. It's, it's right at the first, qu first quadrant at 45 degrees or pi over four, t will be pi over four. That's the first time this equation will hold. And so our answer will be pi over four, so the answer will be a. All right, 18, we have large f is the function given by the integral from three to x to the tangent of five t times the secant of five t minus one dt. So which of the following is an expression for large f prime of x? Okay, so this is an example of using the second fundamental theorem of calculus. If you recall, um, in, 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 in the, sometime in chapter four, usually, in, the, in one of the chapters where you learn about, you know, how to first integrate, um, the, the process of integration is basically the inverse of differentiation. So when you differentiate this, when I take the derivative of this, it undoes integration. It, it basically cancels this out. In a sense, it's kind of like how adding and subtracting are opposites, how dividing and multiplying are all opposites. Anyways, the second fundamental theorem of calculus says you simply can just or differentiate this and it'll be the, whatever this is. And we just use that x to fill it in because t is just a dummy variable. So it's just gonna be the tangent of five x times the secant of five x minus one. So the answer will just be d. It's that simple. And number 19, we have f is the function given by f of x is equal to two times the cosine of x plus one. What's the approximation for f of 1.5 found by using a line tangent to the graph of f at x equals pi over two? Okay, so um, we're essentially just gonna um, look for an equation of a, a linear equation at this point and then calculate what, what that linear equation's value would be when x is pi over two. So we want to basically find the equation of the tangent line. So to find the equation of the tangent line, remember, remember it's just like, I like to use slip intercept form naturally. So y equals mx plus b. Find the equation of this line at this point. So first I have to find what the slope is, and that's going to be the derivative of this at x is pi over two. So f prime of x will be negative two times the sine of x. And if I wanna find f prime of pi over two, I'm basically taking negative two times the sine of pi over two. Sine of pi over two you should know is one. 
So then this is just negative two. Oops. And then so far then I know my slope will be y equals negative two x plus b. And that'll be the slope of my line. So I can go from here. Now let me solve for my um my y intercept. And I can simply just evaluate. I want to find when x is pi over two, what's y going to be equal to? So I need to find an x and a y point to plug in. So if x when x is pi over two, I just plug in just to code, I just plug pi over two into here. So y will be two times the cosine of pi over two, or just two times zero. So it's just going to be it's just going to be one. So when x is pi over two, y is one. So we know this line is going to go through the point pi over two comma one. It's going to go through that point. And then we can use this to help us solve for the y-intercept. So we can set one equal to negative two times pi over two plus b. Solve for b. And b is just going to, these will cancel. We'll get negative pi, so b will be one plus pi. And then I just rewrite my equation as y is equal to negative two x plus one plus pi, because that's my b, essentially. So I have the equation of my linear function, and I can use this now to approximate the value when x is 1.5. So I just look for the y value when x is 1.5. I just plug in 1.5 for x, negative two times 1.5 plus one plus pi. That's is gonna be negative three plus one, so negative two plus pi. And that's it, that's gonna be my answer. Negative two plus pi, and that's the same as C. All right. 20, let f be the function given by this crazy equation f of x equals x minus two over two times the absolute value of x minus two, which of the following is true. Okay, this is gonna be um, one of those functions you wanna be um, familiar with, because these actually come up, come up quite commonly. Um, what happens with these types of functions is that there is gonna be a, a jump to continuity at two. Um, so when x is two, the y value, usually these are basically without, usually these are gonna be given without like a two in the denominator will be simple. Like a lot of times you'll get maybe a function like x minus two over the absolute value of x minus two. And then it'll be basically one and positive one. But since this, is, since this has a one over two essentially, this is like a one over two, it's gonna be approaching positive one half from the left, or I'm sorry, positive one half from the right, and positive or negative one half from the left. And again, this is something you wanna just kind of um, do a couple of practice problems so you don't have to spend too much time like calculating it out. Um, I mean, I could calculate it out and you know show you and through the brute, through you know plugging and chugging numbers, but um, it's not that's it's not really the calculus part. Um, this is this is what the graph will look like, and what this is is that there's going to be a point of discontinuity, or a jump we call it like a jump, you know. So then it's going to be C. And then 21, if f of x equals the natural log of x and the limit as x approaches three of f of x minus f of three over x minus three is, now, if you recall, like when you have something like this, um, you, got, you, you got to do some you know, trickery because if you were to plug in just three, you would have f of three minus f of three over three minus three. 
you would have, you know, zero over zero, you have undefined expression, you know. So usually you learn in like chapter one and two, like some sort of like algebraic or strategy to kind of make this work and some, you know, multiplying by the conjugate or, you know, factoring, that sort of thing. But as you guys, you know, already, you know, through the, you know, through, through the course by this point, through all, you know, through all the six chapters, you should be able to recognize that this is just the derivative of, of a function. And we have the function here. This is just the derivative of the natural log of x when x is three. This is just the derivative of the natural log of x when x is three. That's, this is just, this is literally the expression. This, this is this. So you just find f prime of x or f prime of three. The derivative of the natural log of x, remember, is one over x. So f prime of three would just be one over three. And so the answer will be one third. That's all, that's all they're really looking for. They're not looking for, I think they're not looking for any long tedious method. They want you to, they want to see if you can recognize that that's a derivative.